This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. This evening I'm going to talk about chosenness, and we already know the answer to the question, and that is, of course, we are the real chosen people. If you happen to be Jewish, or if you happen to be Christian, or if you happen to be Muslim, there is some aspect of that in our sense of who we are as religious people. But I'm not going to talk about it in that way. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to actually tell you three stories give you three narratives, and then I'm going to read a piece of the book. You all have the handouts, right? You have the texts? If anybody doesn't have a text, raise your hand. Anybody? Everybody? Pretty much everybody has one. There are a couple people, maybe someone can pass them the texts. I tell my students, I, I teach a lot of text, because I teach both at USC and at Hebrew Union College. At Hebrew Union College, I teach students who are training to become rabbis and Jewish educators, and we study a lot of religious text. And uh, we talk a lot about text. And I tell my students always, never believe anyone who stands in front of you and says the good book says this, or the good book says that. Insist on them giving you the text. Because I can say anything. I'm an authority, right? I'm a rabbi. I'm a professor. I can tell you the good book says this, and you shouldn't believe me. No one should believe anyone who stands in front of you and tells you what scripture says unless you have a copy of the scripture in front of you, because I can say anything I want to. So I'm giving you the copies of scripture, or at least the pieces that we're going to be looking at this evening. I'm going to give you more than what we're going to look at this evening. And having done that, you still shouldn't trust me, because keep in mind that I have selected those texts to give you. I could have selected another set of texts, and I probably could tell you a different story. So you have to be careful about what texts are being given to you. Remember that scripture is like a sea. It's like an ocean. It has a lot of material in it, and there are many ways to understand the material of scripture, and you have to be sensitive to that as well when you're reading the text. So, okay, so I gave you the text. You're aware of that. You also have to be careful because I translated those texts. And I translated those texts a certain particular way, and I'm going to be reading them in a particular way. So you have to be a little bit suspicious about that as well. So having said that, I hope you'll trust me for the rest of the evening <laughs> as I tell you these stories. Story one. Uh, living in Los Angeles, I'm in the movie business in my mind. And I look at the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible. We're going to be using PC terms now. We don't call that text or that set of texts, that scripture, the Old Testament, because that's a theological statement that those books of scripture are the Old Testament. That is a testament of an old covenant that is now no longer really in force. That's a theological position, a Christian classical theological position. We don't want to take a theological position on that text, so the PC term for looking at the so-called Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible. So we'll be looking at the Hebrew Bible first. And in the Hebrew Bible, the first book, Genesis, is a book that begins with the creation of the universe. Now, it's really interesting what happens with this book, because what we do is we have a kind of focusing. It's almost like a movie. Sometimes you, you'll see the beginning of a movie, you'll see a big panorama shot, and then it will slowly focus on the characters or the theme or the environment, the location in which you're going to really center your view. And that's what happens in the Bible as well. First is God of the entire universe, not just the world, the entire universe. God creates the, the luminous lights in the heavens, creates the sky, and creates the earth. Then you have a first narrowing because the history that is the Bible, because the Bible is very much a historical text, 
The Bible's history begins with the history of creation of everything and immediately begins the job of focusing. The first focus is on earth, on the world. And then God proceeds to create living beings. And God does this in a very systematic way. The Hebrew says, God says, Vayihi, Vayihi or, let there be light, right? And, or he says, Yehi or, let there be light, and then the narrator says, Vayihi or, and there was light. And that's the trope, there's a kind of a, a rhythm. God says, Yehi something, and then Vayihi, it becomes. And that goes for the creation of the seas, the waters, the firmament, and then all of the animals on earth and animals in the water, everything is equal. Yehi, vayehi, until you get to one specific animal, one specific creation, there's a new focus. The language changes and we're focusing in now the history of the world, no longer the history of the universe, history of the world is now going to be focused on the history of humankind. The creation of humankind is different than the creation of every other creature on earth. Second narrowing. And so God creates Adam first, and then Eve, or in another version, both Adam and Eve together, or the man and the woman together. There are two different creation references. Some people say two different creation stories. And we proceed with the history of the universe, the history of the earth, through the history of humankind. Anything else, any living being on earth, any aspect of the universe, that is going to continue in the story of the history of the world or, or the universe is through the history of humanity. And so we have four stories after creation, four stories about humanity. And those four stories are four stories of failure. What's the first failure? How do humans fail the first time? Let's hear it. They, what do they do? They eat from the tree. That was a no-no. That was a failure. God speaks to Adam. God speaks to Eve. They fail. Fine. Then the next failure is what? What happens in the next generation? Cain and Abel. Uh, and what is the error? What's the, what's the failure there? Fratricide. Killing a sibling. Tempting, but not a good idea. What's the next? failure of humanity. Noah. Noah and the flood, right? Humanity is violent. God decides we're, we're going to end it now and start over again. Each time God has a relationship with Adam and Eve. God has a relationship with Cain, at least, Cain and Abel. God has a relationship with Noah. But the relationship is fleeting. It's not all that involved. And then what is the fourth failure of humanity? No. Fourth failure is the next story, the Tower of Babel. So there's a Tower of Babel. Humanity has great arrogance and hubris and decides it's going to get up to God. And God uh, doesn't allow that to happen and humanity becomes dispersed. Then we have the next narrowing. So what we, first we narrowed from the universe to Earth. Then we narrowed into the creation from animals to humans. And now we have a new narrowing of focus in the book of Genesis. And that begins with chapter 12 of Genesis when God has a special relationship with one individual. Who is that individual? That individual is Abraham. So let's take a look at the first text on the first page. Genesis 12, the Lord said to Abram, his name is Abram here, go forth from your native land and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse him that curses you and all the families of the earth shall be blessed through you. Why did God choose Abraham? According to the book of Genesis. It's a trick question. Uh, where does it say that in the book of Genesis? Abraham rejected, the answer is Abraham rejected idolatry. Where does it say that in the book of Genesis? It doesn't. All right. So, it, the first reference to Abraham is the one verse before the first verse of Genesis 12. It's not there. I can assure you, don't trust me. Look at it yourself. I can assure you it doesn't give you the answer. The answer is not explicit in the book of Genesis. 
Abraham is chosen by God. God has a relationship with Abraham. And from then on, God's relationship with humanity changes. First, God places Adam and Eve in the garden, basically says, go for it. They fail. Cain and Abel, an instruction here or there, go for it, Cain and Abel, failure. The generation of the flood, total failure. The generation of the dispersion, that is the Tower of Babel, another failure. From now on with Abraham, there's a new modus operandi. God is going to be involved personally with this person and then his immediate family and then his extended family and his children who become a set of tribes, eventually a tribal nation. And now the history of humanity is no longer the history of humanity. It's the history of one community of humanity. And all the rest of the humans on earth, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Canaanites, the Moabites, you name it, all the people that appear in the Bible only appear insofar as they are in relationship with Abraham and his extended family and descendants. It's the final narrowing of focus, and it all happens in the first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis. Fascinating, interesting. Question. Who wrote it? <laughs> That's a good question. Who wrote it? Who wrote the book? Now, here's the rules of engagement for this evening. You can ask a question, any question, but I may not answer it. The reason I won't answer it is either it will take us a little bit too far off topic and I'm very easily distracted, or because I don't have the answer and I don't want to let you know that I don't really know it. <laughs> so I'll tell you it's off topic. Um, the, the question of who actually wrote scripture is a, is a complex question and we can't really deal with it this evening, I'm sorry. Okay, because we're gonna, it's gonna be, we're gonna get distracted from the direction of where we're going today. So now we have Abraham, we have his family, and that special relationship between Abraham and his family and his descendants is defined in the Hebrew Bible through a, a, an institution called covenant. Covenant is a special relationship, and the covenant par excellence is described in Genesis chapter 17. That's the next box. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram, Abram, here, and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk in my ways and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will make you exceedingly numerous. Now, I bolded walk in my ways and be blameless. That's because I think that is actually giving us part of the basic reason for the relationship between, or at least the demands of the relationship between God and Abraham. The Hebrew is, it halech lefanai v'hiyetamim. It means something like this, really. If you walk around in front of my face, this is God speaking, you will be innocent. You will be blameless. In the Hebrew Bible, until the last book, the last chapter of the last book in Daniel chapter 12, there is a reference to a world to come or perhaps a resurrection. But that's the only reference that is clear in the entire Hebrew Bible to something that happens to us uh, after death that is related to our behavior on life, in life. That is, that there's, there is no sense in the Hebrew Bible of punishment in hell or reward in heaven. In the Hebrew Bible, punishment and reward is all meted out in this world. After you die in the Hebrew Bible, you go to a place called Sheol. It means something like the place of question. Everyone goes to the same place. Evil people go. Righteous people go. There is no sense of heaven and hell in terms of punishment in an afterlife. That comes into the world of the Near East only at the very end of the Second Temple period, at the end, very end, and after the canonization or the formation of the Hebrew Bible. So one is rewarded or punished by God in the Torah, in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, solely on this earth, right? There is no sense of reward in the world to come. So God is saying to Abraham, I think here, if you walk around in front of my face, so I watch you, and you do as I say, and I am involved with you, and you respond to me positively, you will be blameless. 
If you're blameless, that means I will protect you. The gods in the ancient Near East protected the people who protected the gods. There was a symbiotic relationship. If you weren't good to the gods, the gods wouldn't be good to you. Here is a monotheistic image or notion of God, and God is saying to Abraham, you do the right thing and you will be rewarded. That's the basic statement that's being made here. Okay, so there is a covenant, covenantal relationship between God and a particular family. The sign of the covenant is circumcision, and that is the way it works for many generations. Until the Israelites go down to Egypt, when there's famine in the land, and after 400 years in Egypt, according to the biblical chronology, basically, they are redeemed from Egypt through an exodus, and they now, they went down, there were 72 people who went down to Egypt, that is, the 12 sons of Jacob and their families, 72 people. Do you know how many people left Egypt according to the book of Exodus? According to the book of Exodus, 600,000 males of fighting age left Egypt. 600,000 men between the ages of probably 16 and 24. If you then extrapolate a full population from that, you arrive at roughly 2 million. So according to the book of Exodus, 2 million people now belong to this community that started simply as Abraham and his family. And they left Egypt. And when they left Egypt, they went into the desert and they received a revelation from God in the Torah. This is a, a reaffirmation of that covenant slightly differently. It's a new version. Now it seems as if God can't have a personal relationship with every individual of the two million people in that community that is called Israel now. Israel. Uh, Israel is a term not in traditional Jewish law and in the biblical world. It doesn't mean the modern state of Israel. It means the people of Israel or the children of Israel. Those are the descendants of Abraham through the 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob, and a number of other communities that joined them when they left in the Exodus. Uh, there are uh, a couple of references that, that weren't just a kinship group. It wasn't just a genealogical relationship of all of those people that received the Torah or the revelation at Mount Sinai, but rather a combination of Israelites and other communities as well. And then at Mount Sinai, a new formulation of the Old Covenant is taking place. The covenant is renewed, and we see that basically in Exodus chapter 19, so it's also on page 1. I'll just read it to you pretty quickly, and you'll see that now, instead of a personal relationship between God and a small family, where the family has to behave in front of God properly, God is going to uh, give instruction, which is called in the Hebrew Torah, Torah, instruction, and this huge, large, massive community now has to uh, obey God's instruction that is written in the Torah and remains in that special relationship with God. If they do obey the instructions, they will be rewarded, and if they don't, they are punished. So Exodus chapter 19. On the third new moon, after the Israelites, that is Israel, had gone forth from the land of Egypt, Moses went up to God. The Lord called him from the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob and declare to the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. Now then, if you will obey me conscientiously and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples of the earth. I'm sorry, of all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's a pretty strong statement. Now the entire community is in a chosenness relationship divine election with God. All of this is narrated in the text of the Torah and the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, and this becomes a national literature through which, directly or indirectly, all three families of monotheism understand their origins. This story that I told you, and I told you, remember, I told you my version of the story, this story in one way or another is understood to be the foundational story of all three religious traditions. That's the first story that I'm telling you. Now I'm going to tell you a different story. 
a story about how religion functioned in the ancient Near East. In the ancient Near East, there wasn't really much of a difference between a tribal community and a religious community. Every nation, when I say nation, I don't mean a nation state. I mean an ethnic community, an extended ethnic community. Every ethnic community had its own ethnic god. Now, in the ancient Near Eastern world of polytheism, there were powers that were understood by the people that ran the universe, not just a single god, but a variety of gods. Okay, this is polytheism. And in the way it was practiced in the ancient Near East, there were powers or gods or goddesses who ran the weather, who were in charge of fertility to make sure that your crops came in, that your, your goats and sheep had babies so that you could survive. There were powers or gods that were associated with the weather. Did I say that already? And that also with the seas and the water, issues like that. But in addition to that, each tribal community had its own tribal god. And they had a very special relationship with that god. We know this. We know this not only from biblical writings, but from the writings that we've dug up in archaeological digs. We have confirmation between some sections of the Hebrew Bible and archaeological remains that include stories. We have a famous story about a conflict between the Israelites and the Moabites. It's told in the book of Kings. I'm sorry, in the book of Numbers. No, it's told in the book of Kings, I think. And it's also told in a stone. The, the same story of the same battles were told in a stone called the Moabite stone or the Mesha stone that actually said the same story, except that uh, each side said they won. So can't get any corroborative information to know exactly who did. Someday we'll in an archaeological dig, we'll find the DVD, and then we'll know. But until then, we have to be patient. So all the various groups, so for example, the Moabites had a god named Chemosh. The Ammonites had a god named Milcom. The Philistines had a god named Dagon. The Tyrians from Tzur had a goddess, a goddess named Ashtoreth. The Babylonians, Marduk. And the Israelites had a god as well. Now I'm sort of making a transition and I'm going to be a little bit, how do I say this, uh, syncretistic, sectarian, and heretical. According to current biblical scholarship, the Israelite community, that people that we call the Israelites or the children of Israel, were polytheists at one time. And they made a transition from polytheism to monotheism. It took many generations. What we think of when we read the Hebrew Bible today is we think of Israel as a monotheistic community. But there's a lot of evidence in the Hebrew Bible that it was a very difficult transition to transition from polytheism to monotheism. And the Israelites were the first community to do that successfully. The Israelites had a god at one point that was no more powerful than the gods of the neighboring peoples. And that god had a name because all the gods had a name. Why did a god have to have a name? Because when you made an offering to the god, you wanted to make sure that your god got to smell the sweet aroma of the offering and not somebody else's god. So you said, I'm making an offering in the name of so-and-so so that that god would smell the aromas. Now, that's important because in the old polytheistic system of the ancient Near East, there was a symbiotic relationship between the gods and the people. The gods needed the people as much as the people needed the gods. The gods were more powerful, but they needed to be fed by the people. How do we know this? Well, there's vestiges of it even in the Bible. But if you know the Gilgamesh epic, you know the Noah story in the Gilgamesh epic or the flood story in the Gilgamesh epic? Uh, the gods destroyed humanity on earth. Why did they destroy humanity in the Gilgamesh epic? Anybody know? They're too noisy. Too noisy. Oh, yeah, I mean, I can relate to that too. <laughs> but it was a little excessive because once people were destroyed, the gods had nobody to feed them. And so when the Noah character, do you know his name in the Gilgamesh epic? Yes, Udnapishtim. He, when he made it to the island and he offered an offering of thanksgiving, the image that is in that book is phenomenal. It says the gods 
flew around the smoke of the sacrifice like flies because they were so hungry because they hadn't been fed for such a long period of time. So it was important to know who your God was so that the sacrifice went to the right place. And it's also telling because by knowing the name of the God, oh, this is really fun. <laughs> by knowing the name of the God, it says something about the relationship between the community and the God or the power that is in relationship with that community. What does it say? It says that there was more equality in the relationship than there would be if you had a relationship with a God whose name you didn't know. What does that mean? It's a psychology of knowing names. You know, if you've ever been to a, a party and somebody knows your name and you don't know their name and you feel very much at a disadvantage, yeah? Or you were dumb enough to walk down the street with a cap that had your name on it and somebody who you didn't know, like what happened to me when I was really nerdy. I mean, I, I got over it, right? The nerdy part, I think. Uh, I walk down the street and somebody says, hey, Ruvain. Oh, and I don't know who the guy was. He was bigger than me and he made fun of me because I had a name on my cap and I said, right, I felt really stupid because he had a certain power over me because he knew my name. I didn't know his name. There is a sense of relationship and connection of knowing names and knowing identification. In, in many cultures, uh, baby children are not named until after they become viable. So that's so that the angel of death or the evil powers may not get them. So there is a sense of knowing names. The name of the God of Israel was made of four letters that we do not know how to pronounce in the Jewish world. Some Christian communities pronounce it Yahweh, right, or Jehovah. But what that really is talking about, what that is conveying, is that in the ancient world, the Israelites knew the name of their God, just like the Moabites and the Ammonites knew the names for their gods. But when at some point in history, the Israelites made a transition from a polytheistic relationship with a limited God to a sense of a universal, all-powerful, all-knowing God, it was impossible, it was inconceivable that they should know the name. You know, we don't know the name of God in the Islamic tradition either. It's just Allah simply means the God. It's not Frank, not Jim, not Penelope, right? So that seems to be indicative of that change. Now, if you don't believe me, and you, it's okay for you not to believe me, it's okay for you to be wrong. Um, I'm continuing on this motif earlier. Let's turn to the next uh, item on page two, Second Kings. I'm just going to read you the first couple of verses here. This is a statement about the reforms that were made by a king named Josiah. He destroyed all of the idols that were being worshipped in Jerusalem by the Israelites because he was a real staunch supporter of monotheism. Then the king ordered the high priest, Hilkiah, the priests of the second rank and the guards of the threshold to bring out of the temple of the Lord, this is yet, all of the objects made for Baal and Asherah. These were... God, it was a god and a goddess, and all the hosts of heaven. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron. He removed the ashes to Bethel. He suppressed the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had appointed to make offerings at the shrines in the towns of Judah and in the environs of Jerusalem. And those who made offerings to Baal, to the sun and moon and constellations, all the hosts of heaven. It goes on. There's a lot more. So Israel, this community, was the first community to make the successful transition from polytheism to monotheism. And Israel, and Israelites, eventually Jews, were associated with monotheism. They were the founders of monotheism. Now there's evidence, by the way, that there may have been other communities that were monotheist even before Israel, or maybe proto-monotheist, or nearly monotheist. One, uh, one option is in Egypt, Akhenaton, Akhenaten, uh, who was a, uh, probably at least a proto-monotheist, but it didn't survive. The, the idea didn't, didn't hold out. Israelites were the ones that were able to, to make it work and kept to it. And so the Israelites were, uh, made that transition to monotheism. There's one thing I neglected to tell you in this story, and that is that when you have a personal relationship with a tribal god, you have a very special relationship. It's, it's like, like we're made for each other. 
your God helps you. When you go into battle against your nasty neighbors who live on the other side of the river and are peeing upstream, your God goes into battle with you. And their God goes into battle with them. And the more powerful God, or the better God, or the God who is better fed by his community through sacrifices, is the God that prevails. So there's a sense of intimacy between the community and its God. The community probably really loves its God as well as it probably fears its God. And that is a relationship that I describe as chosenness. It was like we were chosen for each other. It's an intimacy. Now, the Israelites had that notion with their God. And although we have no written evidence that the Moabites or the Ammonites or the, Ash the Ashdodians or the, the Philistines, they never wrote, we are the chosen people that we have found in any text so far. I am extrapolating. I assume that probably everybody in the ancient Near East had this sense of chosen relationship with their own God. Israel retained that sense of personal relationship with the God of Israel, because it's called the God of Israel in the Torah, when it made that transition to monotheism. So it associated its once tribal God, now the God of the universe, who is the God of all, with a special intimate relationship. It's an accident of history. Because how could the God of the universe also have a chosen relationship with one small people? It doesn't make sense. And yet it's so deeply embedded in the culture of ancient Israel that they couldn't let it go. Even though there was some ambivalence, and we'll look at some texts that show that they were ambivalent about it. So the Israelites were monotheists, and they retained the sense of intimacy with the God who is now the God of all humanity. Now what happened to all of those ancient religions of the ancient Near East? They all died out. The only surviving vestige of the ancient Near Eastern religions is the religion of Israel. And the is religion of Israel, which is now Judaism, carries within it some vestiges of those old times. One is that sense of relationship with God, a kind of sense of chosen relationship, an accident of history. Now, all of the ancient religions died out by the Roman period, the end of the Roman period. Um, and that's a longer story. It's in the book. I would tell you, you should buy the book, but what can I say? It's not here. Um, now I'm going to move up a little bit in history, and I'm going to end this piece of the story. When in the period of the Greco-Romans, around the time of Jesus, and even before, 100 years before Jesus, there was a developing anxiety and malaise among many Greeks and Romans because they didn't really believe their old religious traditions. They were into philosophy. They were also into sacrifice. They didn't, it didn't make sense anymore. The bickering gods in Olympus acting like humans. There was a better option. Here it is. There's one great god, a moral, ethical god, who created the universe, not bickering not silly, not jealous, not having sexual relationships with humans and creating Hercules and doing dumb human things, but a transcendent God and a, a beautiful God and a God that demands moral ethical behaviors instead of the non-immoral or amoral behaviors of the gods of the ancient Greco-Roman world. And there was an option that was available, and that was monotheism. And monotheism was a package deal. There was only one option in the early period, and that was biblical monotheism. And that included a sense of chosenness. So when you bought into monotheism, you became chosen. You became part of the deal. And contrary to some popular beliefs, it was possible, and it happened a lot, that people converted to Judaism in the Second Temple period. Greeks and Romans became Jewish through conversion. That's the end of... Um, story number two, story number three, and we're going to move a little more quickly now. The last narrative is the story of the emergence of new religions. <clears throat> you know, there are new religions coming into history at all times, uh, even in our own generation. What do we call new religions today? Cults. Cults. We don't call them religions, do we? Is cult a negative, a neutral, or a positive designation? Negative. negative. 
on a good day, we might call a cult a sect. <laughs> might sound a little bit better. Sects are also negative. Why don't we call new religious movements new religions? Because they're new. Because we, most of us, certainly people codger, codgers like me, represent establishment religions. Establishment religions don't like new religions. Why don't establishment religions like new religions? Because new religions are threatening to establishment religions. Because maybe my children will not come home for Passover or for Shabbat and spend time with me. Because maybe they're going to go and follow a new, I'm not going to say prophet, but I'll say guru or some guru actually is not a negative term. It's only a negative term in 60s, post 60s American discourse. Because we are, we, I, as a religious person, I am threatened by a new religious movement. What? My religion isn't good enough? And as an establishment religion, a representative of the establishment religion, I don't want a new religion to be successful. And so I do all I can to prevent a new religion from being successful. I call it a cult. I say it's a bunch of, we say in Latin, narishkeit. That's a Yiddish term, really. It means silliness. And the prophet is not a real prophet. And the message is not a real divine message. We do everything we can to prevent a new religion from becoming successful. And most religions fail. There are more than 2,000 religious movements have begun in the United States and Europe since the Second World War. It's been counted by um, academics who study new religious movements. Most of them fail. Some new religious movements <coughs> succeed. By the way, what's the difference between a cult and a religion? The answer is 100 years. <laughs> if you can live 100 years, you're no longer a cult. You become a religion. So today, and I don't mean anything negative in my statement, but there are new religious movements that were considered cults and had no respect at all that now, after 100 or 150 years, are now becoming, finally, accepted as acceptable new religious movements, but with difficulty. The, probably the most famous one is what? Uh, Baha'i and the LDS Church. LDS Church may be even more than Baha'i today, but Baha'i as well, right? So, um, okay, so now, what makes a new religion successful? Now, that's been an object of study in the academic field of religion for an, about two decades, maybe a little bit more. And there is a problem that new religions have, and that is how do you demonstrate that you're authentic? How do you demonstrate to a pool of potential believers that what you have to offer them is real? How can I convince you that I'm really a prophet and the message I'm giving you is truth and that I am uh, an emissary of God? The only way to do that successfully is to use paradigms that already are respectable. If I say to you, for example, I'll give you a great example. I'm a, I'm a prophet. Now, let's see. I'm, on, I'm a prophet now, okay? And I'm going to tell you my message. And my message might be lovely and very deeply moving and very spiritual. And you ask me, how do I know what I know? And I'm going to tell you the truth. I receive my message from my, like it's, it's like a transmitter in my pinky. You're already giggling. And the only time I really get that message is when I'm sitting on the toilet. More giggles. Now, that may be true. What if it really is true? What if it really does happen? I mean, it's possible that that could be. But I could never convince you of that because the paradigm is not respectable. It's not something that is seen as authentic. I need to demonstrate to you that I'm an authentic prophet. And my prophecy, not only the message, but the way in which it comes to me and the way I convey it to you is one that is recognizable to you. And so new religious movements always incorporate within themselves the motifs and symbols of established religions. Abraham, for example, he is the individual who is in relationship with God the first and the most intimate relationship with God, at least in the ancient world. And so he shows up, in, not only in the Torah, in the Hebrew Bible, 
but in the New Testament and the Quran as well. So when a tradition is successful, it's successful partially because it's able to utilize the motifs that have been demonstrated to be successful motifs in history. Chosenness was so deeply associated with monotheism in the ancient world that all new expressions of monotheism seem to, in one way or another, a little bit less so in the more modern period, uh, define themselves as chosen people. You can see this with David Koresh. You can see this with uh, a lot of movements in the 60s and the 70s. Um, and because chosenness was so closely associated with authentic monotheism by an accident of history when Israel made the transition from polytheism to monotheism, that it became an item of importance. But then the question is, uh, who's the real chosen people? And new religious traditions tend to make the case that they are the real chosen people. And so when Christianity emerged into history, there was a sense, an agreement between both Jews and Christians that only one community could be truly chosen at a time. The Jews said, we're chosen, of course, we have the evidence. And Christians said, you were chosen, but now we're chosen. So I would like to show you another uh, text here. Uh, we'll go to page three. Bottom of the page, Hebrews, letter to the Hebrews, chapter eight. In fact, the ministry which has fallen to Jesus is far superior to theirs, as are the covenant he mediates and the promises upon which it is legally secured. Had the first covenant been faultless, there would be, have been no need to look for a second in its place. But God, finding fault with them, says, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will conclude a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not abide by the terms of the covenant and I abandoned them, says the Lord. I'm just gonna, in the interest of time, I'll skip down to the bottom. By speaking of a new covenant, he has pronounced the first one old and anything that is growing old and aging will shortly disappear. In the Articulation of covenant in the Hebrew Bible, there's only one covenant, that's between God and Israel. In the articulation of covenant in the New Testament, there can only be one covenant at a time. It's a zero-sum game. If we are the chosen, you are not the chosen. So it becomes an exclusive, not, no less exclusive, in the New Testament than in the Hebrew Bible. Five or six hundred years later, another religion emerges into history very successfully, and that is Islam. And we have some interesting information about Islam that comes from the Quran. Remember that, that scripture is the earliest evidence we have for a new religion. The earliest text that we have for Judaism is the Torah, is the Bible. The earliest text we have for Christianity is the New Testament, and the earliest text we have for Islam is the Quran. But there was a difference in the world in which Islam emerged that was significantly different than the world in which Christianity and Israelite religion emerged. When Israelite religion emerged, it was the only option that was monotheist. It was natural for it to consider itself chosen. When Christianity emerged, there was one monotheism previous. And it was natural for Christianity to believe that since there could be one chosen people, there can't be two at a time, and so there could, it's a zero-sum game. When Islam emerged into history in the seventh century, there were numbers of different expressions of monotheism. Not only was there Judaism and Christianity, but there were different types of Christianity that were arguing with one another over which was the best expression of Christianity, and there were different types of Judaism as well. So when Islam emerged into history, it didn't, it wasn't natural to think of chosenness as a zero-sum equation. It saw Jews who were chosen people. It saw Christians who were chosen people. It saw other Christian communities that said were maybe a little more chosen than the other Christian community. It saw there were other neo-monotheistic communities even living in Arabia that we know of as well. And so the Islamic perspective on chosenness is a little bit more uh, open 
than either the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament. It's actually more pluralistic. But it still needs to make the case that it is in a better position than the previous religions. Because remember that when Islam emerges into history, the establishment religions are what? Judaism, Christianity, and Arabian paganism or Arabian idolatry. And it needs to make a case against these traditions that are trying to prevent it from being successful. So if you read on the bottom of page four, <clears throat> this is a statement from God articulated in the Quran. God made a covenant with the children of Israel. And we, this is God speaking, and we spent, sent them 12 chiefs or leaders. God said, I am with you. If you engage in prayers and you give required giving or required charity, you believe in my messengers and help them or honor them and lend to God a good loan, which is an idiom for uh, in, um, uh, contributing your resources to the community. I will absolve you from your evil deeds and cause you to enter gardens through which rivers flow. So whoever of you believes after that has, has disbelieves after that has strayed from the right way. But because of their breaking their covenant, we have cursed them and made their hearts hard. They distort or change words from their places. This seems to be a reference to scripture. And forgot part of what they were reminded through revelation. You will continue to discover the treacherous among them except for a few, but forgive them in pardon, for God loves the good. And those who say we are Christians, we made their covenant, but they forgot a part of what they were reminded through revelation. So we incited enmity and hatred between them until the day of resurrection when God will tell them what they have done. This is a kind of invalidating, not the covenant of the Jews or the covenant of the Christians, but the way that the Jews or Christians are practicing the covenant. It opens up a, a way, a place for a religion that will correct the errors that were being practiced by the Jews and Christians beforehand. So here we have a kind of opening of Islam as a new religious movement to find its place within that constellation of monotheisms that were in existence at the time. And so we have a, a situation where we have a continuing argumentation between new religions and establishment religions over who is more authentic than the others. The reason for the argumentation from a, using the language of, uh, of economics is essentially that the religions are competing with one another for a market share of believers. In order to be a successful religion, you need to have enough followers to pay the salaries of the religious leaders, to build the synagogues and the mosques and the churches, and to uh, develop the education. I mean, it, you, you need a substan substantive base. And if you don't have the base, you won't survive. And there's a limited base, a kind of competition for that uh, base of believers. That is what chosenness is all about. It started, I believe, as a, an accident of history, a reflection of ancient Near Eastern religion that became embedded in monotheism and became an item, a notion, a symbol of authenticity that was picked up by new religious traditions as they emerged into history, and it became a point of contention. Now, I'm going to read to you two pages, not too long, and with that, I'll end. We've taken a journey through history in the notion of chosenness. We've observed its birth in the cauldron of ancient Near Eastern polytheisms and how it became a core part of the self-concept of one small community of monotheists. We observed how it became an authoritative marker of authenticity in the polemics and arguments between competing expressions of monotheism. We have observed how the notion of election triumphed along with the victory of monotheism as Christianity and Islam were established as the imperial religions in the world's greatest empires. The notion of chosenness became a sine qua non of monotheism. It has been so deeply linked to monotheism that it's difficult to conceive of monotheism without the notion of true believers believing in a special, intimate, and unique relationship with the one great God. Were all of humanity to believe in the same kind of monotheism, or even if only all monotheists would believe in the same kind of monotheism, then we would all belong to the same community in chosen communion with God. If this were to occur and all would consider themselves part of the same elect community, then perhaps the elitism of chosenness would disappear and the tensions 
that lead people to bicker, brawl, and sometimes go to war would end. But humanity has never believed in the same kind of monotheism. The human species seems to have been created in such a way that its members simply and naturally disagree. They argue. They inevitably have different opinions. The human condition seems to be that if we see, that we see things differently from one another and we feel entitled to our own opinions and to our own perceptions of the universe. Even those who grew up in the same household with the same family education and the same religious experiences and education and training often have very different views of God, humanity, and the universe. Was humanity created to be contrary? I doubt whether that would have been part of the great design. But it says in the Hebrew Bible that uh, a very interesting thing about the creation of humanity. God said, let us make human beings in our image after our likeness. I seriously doubt whether humans were created for the purpose of being stubborn, but I'm convinced that they were created with the potential for independent thinking. Part of our divine image, I think, is to have been created to be sentient, alert, attentive beings. Unlike simple machines or even complex computers, humans were created with a unique essence and individuality that's deeply embedded in our processing mechanisms. We reflect as we process the world around us. We tend to think independently as we wonder at the beauty of creation and we ponder the meaning of existence. Given that these traits reflect our deepest and most basic nature, how could it be possible that we were created otherwise? Should it be surprising to the creator that our human need to think independently would prevent us from agreeing even about the nature of our own creation? This is a conundrum that we're unlikely to resolve a mystery for which human experience will never find a definitive answer. We're unable to agree on the answer because we continue to think about the nature of our existence in new ways. Even the greatest theologians have not been able to agree on the nature of our human relationship with eternity, or even on the nature of human existence. An old Jewish tradition compares the creation of coinage with the creation of God's creatures. The likeness of the king on the coin, or the emperor, or the caliph, appears the same for every one of the thousands or millions of coins that are stamped into existence. But the likeness and nature of every single individual creature of God is unique. There are no two alike. With adequate awareness of this awesome difference, we can only realize our humility in the presence of the creator of the universe. Each of our religious traditions reflects the truth of God and of God's creation. Each scripture is a revelation of the divine message. But even if every single word were the exact enunciation of God, we would still disagree over their meanings. I can only consider this to be part of the divine plan. Now, I personally grew up within one of many religious systems that have emerged through this mystery of human creation. I count myself to be a believing member of my religious affiliation, and I consider it a pathway to truth. But I have enough experience studying other religious paths to transcend the naivete that only I can have the keys to truth, that only I and those who agree with me can know the code that will allow me to pass through the door to redemption. I know too many people much wiser than me who follow a different path and from whom I have learned great wisdom. I consider myself a member of a community that's in a unique relationship and a chosen relationship with God. My own community is unique. There's no other like it. And within my community, I count myself a member of one subgroup of believers that's different than others within my larger re religious affiliation. We are uniquely different than many others within the community. And I count myself a unique individual within my subgroup. There's no other individual who seems to have exactly the same perspective as I have. No one sees the world quite like me or quite like you. An old dictum teaches that a minority of one is only a fool. But we are all, when naked and alone, on the last day of our lives, or on the last day, a minority of one. No matter what we profess, our essential, unique, individual nature is known only to the one who created all. In the same way that we are unique in our own individuality, we're also unique in our small communities so also are those conglomerates of communities that make up our unique religious affiliations. Every religion is unique, and each has access to wisdom, including wisdom about God and eternity. 
But no religion has wisdom about which all of us can agree, and none has the right to be confident that it has a monopoly on truth. If God created everyone to be absolutely unique, are we not all chosen? Thank you. What is your thoughts, or what are your thoughts, if any, about there being somewhat of a paradigm shift that so long as people, humankind, is choosing God, that the paradigm can be that then all who choose God are chosen? Uh, what are your thoughts? I, I think, well, you just said it. I mean, I think you said it nicely. Uh, we, we, as, I, I believe that we, I believe that the notion of being created in the image of God is what I just said at the very end of my remarks. Uh, we are, we, we can't help it. We're independent and we think that way. Uh, even in cultures that are extremely repressive, um, some people are willing to kind of give up their independent thinking or do it quietly, but too many people w won't. And uh, so we are constantly engaging in our religious texts. We're engaging in what the Muslims call ijtihad, which is uh, we're, we're engaging deeply with the text uh, in a personal way. And it's never stopped. And it continues, and it will probably continue forever, as long as we are human beings. And so we do need to re-envision the meaning of chosenness in a way that makes sense for us in this world. When we used to live in enclaves, small communities far apart from one another, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, ecologically, we could live with a sense that we're human and the rest aren't. But in a world in which we don't live in enclaves anymore, we're all inseparable from one another and we can't escape that, that is no longer ecological. It is uh, too self-destructive. And so your suggestion of understanding chosenness as a human voluntary choosing rather than God simply understanding humanity or one small portion of humanity as the divinely elect is a way that we, uh, is a, I think a very good and honorable way to understand the notion of chosenness in a modern and postmodern way. And I think it's very important.